My name is Derek Gilman. I'm Professor of Art History and Museum Leadership at Drexel, and I also head collections and exhibitions here. And I had the privilege of being the lead curator for the Electrified show, which is 50 years of Electric Factory. This is how the evening is going to work. We show the documentary. Then uh, we're going to do a Q&A with my distinguished colleague, James McKinney, who's Professor of Music Industry here, who will be talking to David, as well as Kenny Aronson and Quentin Jones, who, after the Q&A, will then play a short set for us. And that will be it. Back in 85, we were on the road constantly. We didn't get off the road. I mean, I kept a suitcase packed. I wasn't ready for what came along with it. And I wasn't equipped to deal with success either. I mean, when I was young, I got into the sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing. What is wrong with me? I am changing by the hour. Band literally had an intervention with me. We were playing gigs, and they stopped doing the gigs for me to go away for three months. You know, the people around me, they're like, we're going to save Dave. And they did. posters and we have material to, to put in the exhibition and because we, Drexel is a great friend of Larry Maggot, yeah. but also because we have one of the world's greatest music industry programs. And I'd just like to acknowledge them this evening and my colleague Ryan Moyes who's over there, my other colleagues who, from music industry who've been involved in the exhibition and this evening I'm delighted to welcome Professor James McKinney who was another a professor of music industry who is going to um, take over the, the moderation of the panel and he'll introduce our speakers whom you all know. So James is a producer himself, he's an engineer, he's a songwriter, he's a vocalist, musician, um, he's everything he owns his own production company so he is um, it's interesting as, uh, as was said in the documentary these days you have to be everything, and James is literally the everyman. So I'm delighted to welcome Professor James McKinney. Thank you so much. It's good to be here, and it's really my honor. Uh, I want to give another round of applause to Jill, who did a magic amazing job. And also, let, let's hear it for Quentin, Kenny. And, Dave. and also a longtime friend of mine who you also saw in the documentary. <laughs> uh, we go back to a lot of uh, late night milkshakes and hamburgers. <laughs> Phil Nicolo. <laughs> so so uh, thank you guys for coming to Drexel, first of all. Uh, thank you for bringing this wonderful film. You know, I, I think the beautiful thing in watching this film as an everyman, like you talked about, like uh, music drives us, music pulls us, music is at the center of it all. You know, um, can you each just talk a little bit about, you know, how that driving force, what a gift it is for you to take that driving force and to build all the things that you, you built? Well, thank you for that, it's really nice. and thank you for coming out. I mean, I'm overwhelmed by this, honestly. Um, very <laughs> um, but music, it's, uh, it's always an adventure, you know, I mean, I think, you 
didn't make it a secret. I was a drug addict, you know. I was always looking for an adventure, and music, um, music provided that for me. Uh, it still does every day. Anything that I'm um, like, I'm fortunate to play with a, a few different bands and different styles, and um, but it 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 always offers something new. Uh, it always feels like something's fresh there, you know, and. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I just feel really lucky, feel blessed to be able to do it, feel physically good that I can do it. it helps my mental state. Um, but, and, and, you know, for me lately, you know, working with such incredible musicians, great engineers, you know, I feel very fortunate. But, um, you know, it's, <clears throat> I, I, I guess Phil and I were talking about it on the walkover after we were looking at the exhibit. It's. Uh, you know, you, you, you just never really get tired of it. It's something that, uh, you know, every day it's new. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an adventure. I love it. I love being able to do music with my friends. And uh, you want to add to that, my friend? <laughs> oh, I'm thinking about this as he's talking. And growing up, I always loved music but I never had much direction or interest in anything normal. <laughs> and I watched my dad and my mom work nine to five jobs, taking the train every day. My dad would come home, he would still sit around with a sh white shirt and tie on. And music saved me from that. I did not want to be wearing a suit and tie and, wear, and working a nine to five job. And except for two years of my life, I made a really nice living playing music. I love music. I've been smitten with music since I was three years old, listening to the music going on in my house because I had an older brother. So I heard doo-wop and Elvis and Phil Spector records and Beatles and, and Particularly when the Beatles happened, that was it for me, and I just started to play drums, and because my brother was a drummer, so there was a drum set in the house, and I always heard drums and bass, and I always heard the rhythm section, and that's just what I wanted to do, and I was fortunate enough to, for it to have worked out for me, so. Well, neither one of my parents had normal jobs. My dad was a horse trainer, my mom was an opera singer, and I grew up on the road. I had a, older brothers and sisters like Kenny. I stole their records all the time. In fact, one year for Christmas, I bought my dad Johnny Cash live at San Quentin, and I heard it, and then I, then I stole it. No, it was at San Quentin, and I stole the record on Christmas night, so there you go. Uh, my, my career goals were never, uh, you know, fame, fortune, and all that. I mean, that's all wonderful, but I mean, I just wanted to be able to hang with guys like this. <laughs> I just wanted to be in the same room with these guys, and I'm very fortunate that they put up with me. And they're wonderful, and when you play with great people, you look good. <laughs> so, that's that. Absolutely. I don't want to you. Uh, what these guys said. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I've been doing this for almost 47 years now. Uh, I have a twin brother. We worked together for many, many years. We started my parents' attic when we were in Temple University, and and thank God kept doing it. And it's the same routine. Uh, it's been in my blood. It's been in my, I mean my er earliest memory of music before I could talk. My parents are from Italy. My dad, between the two of them, they didn't make 300 bucks a week. My dad was a butcher in Conchahokan. My mom was a seamstress. But my dad loved Italian opera. So growing up. All the time, I would hear La Boheme, La Traviata, Madame Butterfly, Rossini, all the great stuff. And that's what I, and it just captured my attention that I just loved, I was passionate about music. And I still remember, and, and again, I had the fortune of working with this artist like uh, 50 years later. But I was six years old, next door with my, my friends, and his sister was playing with their 45s. And she played Leslie Gore, It's My Party, and I'll Cry If I Want To. And it captivated me. I stopped what we were doing, I went over to the 45 player, and I watched it play. 
And it was just like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I mean, it captured my emotion. And I was an, a music lover. About 40 years later, 50 years later, I worked with Leslie Gore, who since passed away. Her godchild is a good friend of mine. I, with Blake Morgan, produced her last record. I told her that story, and she said, that's one of the greatest things I've ever heard. <laughs> that I was like the start of your career, and it was, it really was. And again, I've been so passionate and fortunate. I love what I do, just like these, I wake up every day can't wait to do it. I can't wait to do it tomorrow. And, and that, that's that love and that passion that we're blessed with. That people say, when are you going to retire? retire? When you see my name in the obituary, I retired the day before. That's basically it. There's a thread of that love of music. And, you know, also, there's a few other threads, you know, um, amongst you. Like, you, you all work with such luminary artists in your, in your whole careers. You got to meet your heroes. Um, at times and played with them at times. Um, and then you have this beautiful connection of still making the music you want to make, also a connection to Philly, uh, a very special connection to Philly. Um, and then a common thread just from my research is the real love of the Beatles that each of you individually love the Beatles. Am I right, Ken? Yes. Yeah. You too? Yeah. yeah. So, so with, with all those threads together, can you, can you just say a little bit about how special it is to, to still share your music, um, even with small audiences, as it compared to a stadium full of 10,000 people live or something like that, you know, like with this love of music, with these common threads that you have, how, how special is it to share our audience like this? For me, it's really no, it's really no different, it, you know, it, it's an audience, be it three people, be it 3,000 people. I feel like I bring the same energy, you know, if it's just us in the room playing. If you were here for a sound check, it was a performance. It was, know? it was. So, you know. There was five people here. Yeah, and, um, you know, it, 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 it doesn't change. There's a famous show that was in Philly years ago when the police came into town. I think there were like 37 people for that show, Grendel Slayer. I, uh, 37 people. I know Rob Hyman and Chalky went to that show. Now there's about 40,000 people that were there, you know, because, but, um, you know, I mean, and, and they were bringing it. You know, I think that's what's, you know, where rubber meets the road, you know. <clears throat> you know, you, 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 you perform, we're not mailing it in, and it's not something we do, we just do because we love doing it. And uh, so, I mean, uh, 100,000, 10 people, I'm still going to be, I actually get a little more nervous for 10 people, to be honest with you, but, uh, but I always still feel that twinge of, of like, oh, I'm going to get to perform, I'm going to get to play. It's a great feeling. Absolutely. This, this is just as exciting to me as when I opened up for Led Zeppelin in 1977 on Bill Graham's Day on the Green, which was... A high point in my career, but this is, yeah. feels just as good, yeah. and I think I'm actually more nervous now than I was at that point in time. Yeah. I'm a sucker for an audience. <laughs> I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> I, I, the only thing I know is my mentor, a man that's from Philly uh, in the music scene, was named Charlie Gracie. Yeah. And uh, thank you. I did. I was fortunate to meet the man. And I did four albums with him, and I remember one time he called me up and he said, you know, Van Morrison just asked me to go on the road. He says, can you play the bass? I said, oh yeah, I can play like anybody, but never had one in my life. I called up my friend. But what I witnessed was, I also played this little place in Wildwood called Maury's Pier or something, which, yeah, you sure. know, right, right? Oh, yeah. And it'd be like, like five, six people in there, and I would witness Charlie playing just as hard for those people as he did opening for Van Morrison, which gave me a foundation, which I try to live by every day, which is, you're fortunate just to be able to have somebody sit still long enough to hear you play. You introduced me to Charlie, and he liked my sideburns. He did. <laughs> you see? That's why I have sideburns. I was taking it for him, and I just had to go a little bigger. Yeah, it's the same routine. I mean, it, it's, a, it's not about 
how many, it's about it just seeing three people, just looking at them and seeing them, making them move. That's the thing. That's the emotion. Is is just putting it out there, and it's 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 selfish in that. First of all, whatever I do, I do it for for me first, and thank God you like it too, you know. But it's that that passion of just got to do it. I have to do it. There's nothing that can stop me, and and then and people feel that. I mean, they feel that emotion. They feel that that drive, and it makes them excited. It makes them you know want to be part of it. And so, uh, yeah. That, that was a trick question. <laughs> I think we all knew the answer, but I, you know, it's one of those things that you don't necessarily get to say all the time. Yeah, no, Because you, you mean, you're, you're luminaries, and, but it's, it's just Am one of those fire? You're always, it's always great to, it's always great to play. And this uh, guy is great, I gotta tell you. The, the director of the department, I mean, two things. If you haven't seen the, the, the exhibit, I saw it, you know, again before earlier today. It's great. It is totally great. There's so many cool things there. Posters, consoles. I mean, if you're a techno geek, if you just like guitars, if you like posters, if you like incredible photos, yeah. just want to take a, I mean, literally, a, a, if you want to be in a time machine, check it out. Don't, I'm just telling you, do not miss it. It's wonderful. And as they say, Ryan, the, the staff here, the, the, the engineers and the producers that are the instructors here, are incredible, incredible. And as a producer and as a mixer and as, as an engineer, there are local artists that have the fortune of recording here at Drexel. Um, one of them is a great trumpet player, Matt Cappy. I just mixed and mastered the track that he just recorded. Yeah, Matt's great. I just mixed and mastered the track that he recorded here at, the, at, the, uh, at, at, at Drexel, and it is spectacular. It's, it's really great. So, you know, not only are, are, are they passing on this wonderful talent and knowledge to younger people, but the, the, these students are doing great jobs. And that's what it's about, passing on that knowledge, passing on that passion. Um, so, again, it's, it's wonderful that, that uh, we got to do it here t tonight as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a check later, Phil. No, it's all right. <laughs> I told you we go with Cheeseburgers and milkshakes at yes. 3 o'clock in the okay, morning, there we go. all over the world. <laughs> but with, uh, on that same line, you know, Dave, I noticed... You're a teacher too. Like, I mean, yeah. how important is it to pass along our skills, our, our love of music, our playing skills, our technical skills on the engineering and producing side? But how important is that to each one? Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, it, there's nothing like seeing someone, you know, put a pair, for me, put a pair of sticks in their hands and to learn a grip, whatever their grip is, and then see that aha moment for a young person or I should say, an older person. I had a guy that was 50 years old that was, mm, wanted to take lessons from me. He never played drums, but his dream was to play drums. And he's gigging tonight. He's got a band, he's out playing. He took lessons from me for a couple of years. And I, I don't think it was the teaching, it was more or less his passion for it and his desire to do it. So, I mean, I, I, lo I love being able to give it away. I got some young students. I had one of my students just went in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, Elon Rubin who plays with Nine Inch Nails, but I see some young, and he was 11, 11, 12 years old when he used to come to me in San Diego, and he still talks about that when he does podcasts. Talks about the coffee stain I had on my drum pad. He remembered it, it was so weird. You think the guy becomes this big rock star and he's a rock star. You know, he remembers that. He remembers my dog running around, the door. I had a, a sharp head, and he used to run around us when we used to have our lesson. So I, I love it. I love seeing that happen. I love I love doing. It. I still do it. I got lessons tomorrow. I love. I find a way to do that. I mean, even when during COVID, I was doing it online, and I'm taking lessons too. I still want to learn as much as I can. I got a, a teacher out in Santa Barbara that I study with once a month, and uh, I think it's important to do that because it just keeps you know those students get better than you. You know, you got to stay on top of that. You know? <laughs> I have two of my students here. All right. Um, well, I, I, I do want to at least open up for a few questions before we play. Um, but I, I just want to say personally, I'm a fan. I, I, I see lots of fans out here. I mean, I remember not only songs on the radio, but I remember my high school prom playing your songs, playing the Hooters on my high school prom. I mean, you know, 
I love seeing bands do that too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so many instances. So it's just it's really amazing to to be in the audience. Yeah. To get to experience this film, to get to experience you. I can't wait oh. for the music, but I do want to open up if there are any questions in the audience before before we rock out. Yeah, there's one right there. Joe, I'd like to say the last iteration of this film that you did really was seamless and your best one. <laughs> Tonight, no music tonight. If it wasn't for your video, totally. your documentary, which is really excellent, I want to acknowledge you. Hey, hey, listen, here, here. Listen, Jill was amazing. I mean, I, when she asked, talked to me about doing this, I was, you know, I wasn't totally on board I, I immediately because, it, you know, I, I, and I don't recommend this. I, I went to the um, the first glance film festival without really seeing the documentary, and I realized I'm sitting there going, what did I do? You know, I mean, it's because it was really nerve-wracking, you know, but I knew she, I, you know, the thing is that I had so much trust in her, and she, she was just great, and she did such a wonderful job, and all her documentaries are like that, you know, you should look her up, see what she does, because she's really wonderful, and thank you for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we have a question here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's really sweet. Thank you. Thank you very much. My drummer friend back here. What, what's your question? Well, I've been watching you play drums, Dave, since the 80s, since I was in high school. Not a bad swimmer, am I, either? You're a good Yeah. You can almost keep up with me. <laughs> I've seen you play drums with other bands behind, besides the Hooters, you know, like uh, In the Pocket, of course, and Blues Jams, and Smash yeah. Palace, to name a few. Yeah. Yeah. And in those bands, you're David, David Wasikin. Yes. However, when I see you with the Hooters, yes. you're David. Yes. You're that guy yes. with that punky behind the kit, <laughs> that pretty boy behind the kit playing that ska and reggae. Oh. Do you feel that too, that when you're with the Hooters, it's different for you? There's that special, you know, yeah. spark that you I, It's funny that you, you say that, because somebody asked me today, uh, a friend of mine in a band in Philly, we were talking today, and he said, I watched your tour. And you seemed so, um, your energy was just amazing. He said, and he said that you, I told him about, mm, I had a little bit of a uh, health scare in January. I had to have my gallbladder removed. And uh, I, it was a surprise. <laughs> I didn't know I had a, this going on in me for, and it was about took some years to get there. And I felt, after you get over the recovery, that sucked. But, uh, but once I was back playing, I felt great. I, and, and, and touring, I felt, I felt like that kid again. Like, you know, they even asked me to solo. And they asked me to solo every night. And I did 55 gigs and I did 55 solos. You know, I, you know, I, at one point I said, you know, I'm turning 68 in February. You know, and I was going for it and it felt good. And I felt like I had the energy again. And, and you know, and, and sometimes I would envision me playing at the Brandywine Club or me playing at Grendel's or me playing at the Bijou with those guys playing Bomb Scare or Trouble on Paradise, Point Your Little Pinky, those early songs. You know, it, 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 you know, I feel really lucky, like incredibly lucky to do this. And who gets to get a movie, like a documentary made about him? I mean, it's, are you kidding me? Kid from Levittown? You have to be incredibly good or incredibly bad. <laughs> and he's the, I was a little, he's on the, and they said, Dave splits right down the back. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I, I really I wasn't kidding when I said I didn't think I'd make it to 30. There's so many people that were really responsible for helping me get to get it together. I'm married, I'm living my best life, but my wife is like amazing. I got a great life, I got great friends, I got great, like, you're my friends. And I, I was like, when I saw like Adam come in, Adam, two Adams come in, you know, the people, Jill, her and her husband helped produce it. I was, I, you know, I, I almost wanted to cry, and I still might cry. So thank you. Um, oh, one, one more question here. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to ask you, you did mention a couple of like, what we would call aha moments yeah. in the film. I was wondering if you had just one absolute particular aha moment when you said to yourself, you know what, I'm not going to be a carpenter, I'm not going to be, you know. 
Yeah. This one moment right here yeah. sealed it. An aha moment for me was watching Ed Sullivan and watch Charlie Watts do Paint It Black. That was it. Because Charlie used to, Charlie, if you didn't see Charlie played a traditional grip, but then he turned around and played match grip. And I said, oh, that guy is cool. He did that. So that was mine. <laughs> cool. You got one, Ken. Beatles, Ed no. Sullivan. Beatles. Beatles. Yeah, Beatles, Ed Sullivan. Yeah. Well, and, and Leslie Dave, Gordon, Dave Beatles. Clark, and Dave Gordon, yeah, 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 yeah. and a Rolling Stones. But yeah. Beatles, yeah. first time, Ed Sullivan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Changed my life, too. Beatles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the answer. You know. Yeah. Well, well, before we play, I, I do want to put it in the pocket real quick. It, um, and I, I, I love all the various influences of the music, yeah. ska and reggae, yeah. um, but also the, the depth of jazz and the fact that you brought up Tony Williams. I love Tony Williams. Um, I met him. I hung out with him. I, I hung out with him once yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. beautiful guy. And I've seen him play several yeah. times. Ooh. Yeah. Um, any, any others that any of you got to see or meet that just really influenced your play? I think I, I know the answer for Kenny. I'm not sure if I know the answer for, for Quentin, but um, yeah, uh, in your own instrument, in your own instrument. Well, not an instrument, but okay. the guy that influenced me very much and is still in my nightmares, Robert Gordon. <laughs> I did two albums. I did two albums of Robert Gordon. You know, in the movie, Dave, you said you want to, you know, you always put yourself in a room with people, you know, that are more accomplished. And, 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 and walking in on that first album, Robert playing guitar, and if anybody knows Robert's guitar player, she knows where some, and he was so hard on me. And he taught me that I'm going to be better. You know, he taught me never to, you know, just keep learning and doing whatever you can, just keep getting better. No matter where you're at, get better. And that's Robert Gordon. Right? I have a great love for drums because I had an older brother who was a drummer and I started out playing drums. And I grew up, I, my, brother, my brother turned me on to Louis Belson skin deep drum solo on a Duke Ellington record. And I was just floored by that and to this day Love that, always love Louie, and I met Louie. Yeah, me too. And Louie gave me an autograph for myself and for my brother, yeah. and he was a really nice yeah. cat. Yeah. And I just was always a Louie Belson fan. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on board with Louie too. <laughs> okay. You know, just hung out with him when Tony, but they were just, you know. Amazing. It's like walking around with God, yeah. you know, okay. but they were just so nice, yeah, great. Phil, on, uh, your, on your instruments, engineering, real, producing. Again, real quick, Thomas Mahal. Uh, totally changed my life. Met him in 1990. We've become good friends over the years. I've talked to him. We were, we were hanging down at Jazz Fest this past year. Um, 81 years old. We get into the van on the way to the venue. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Everybody's kind of, turn on the radio. Put on this station. And he, all of a sudden, a, a song comes on. This is Maze before Frankie Beverly. Listen to this, this brother. He's amazing. Eight o'clock in the morning, he is 81 years old, still can't wait to listen and talk about music. That's the passion I'm talking about. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Give it up for these guys.
Song, plus it's going to feature Dave. Want to just start this?
alive.